Well, gentlemen, we are in Romans chapter 8 today, and uh, we've got uh, from verse 28 to verse 39 to cover. That's not a whole lot of territory, but we're going to divide that into two classes, okay? There's a lot there uh, to be covered. Um, we ended up, why don't I, I pick up reading in verse 26. So Romans 8, 26 will cover a little bit of what we did last week at the end. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now we covered those verses last week. The Spirit helps our infirmities. Uh, the Holy Spirit helps us in many, many, many ways, but one of the things he helps in is our prayer life. Um, the truth is you and I don't know a whole lot, okay, about what's going on in the world, what the plans of God are for the world, and so on. And there's a lot of things that we face that we don't know what is the best solution to the, the issues that we face, to the problems that we face. We don't know what to pray for. Um, and one of the great reliefs is that when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit who lives within us, who is Almighty God, all-knowing, all-powerful, He knows the way to pray. He knows the thing, the outcome that we need. And so he prays to the Father, and the Father, it says, who knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit of God prays for us according to the Father's will, and the Father hears those prayers, and he answers them. And so that is a tremendous blessing to know that the member of the Godhead the member of the Trinity who actually lives within us, prays for us. And then he says, and we know, okay, so we know that he prays for us. We know that he prays according to the will of God. We know that the Father hears him, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Okay, so um, we know that and let me get the right place in my notes, which I didn't. Pardon me a second. There we go. Um, all things, whether good or ill, are made to work for our good by our Heavenly Father. It doesn't mean that everything comes into our life is good, but it is made to work for good. God is able to take any situation and turn that to our advantage, to turn that in such a way that it will become a blessing to us, even though it may be a trial or a difficulty that is painful at the time. And there are obviously painful episodes in life. We go through things that are difficult. We go through things that hurt, sometimes physically, sometimes materially, very often spiritually things are difficult, but they work for our good because of our Heavenly Father. He works it for our good. Okay, so we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to His purpose. Um, the word work together is a word that means to be a fellow worker. So the circumstances and God's help work together to produce good in our lives. God sends things or allows things into our lives that may hurt, that may harm, but they benefit us in the long run. And let me just say that this is not, and I don't know how India, how India is. In the United States we hear a lot of, of stuff like, you know, follow your heart, follow your dream. You can accomplish anything you want to accomplish as long as you don't quit, and things of that nature. We hear a lot of the power of positive thinking, and some 
religious people have, have coined the term the power of positive praying. And they act as though a positive attitude is the solution that as long as you keep a positive attitude, it's going to mix with the cosmic aura around you or some such nonsense, and everything is going to turn out to be great. And that is really crazy. Okay? Um, it's good to have a good attitude. It's good to have a positive attitude. And one thing, we can be positive. All things work together for good to them who love God. Okay, if you love the Lord, then God will see to it that everything works out for your benefit. Okay, it will help you, whatever you're going through. Uh, you have bad health. You have trouble with some of your church members. You have persecution from people on the outside, from the lost. These things will work for your good if you love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Okay, so faithful, obedient Christians <clears throat> can claim this promise and know that it always happens. Uh, let me turn over to John chapter 14 and see a cross-reference that I've got here. John chapter 14 and verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's will which sent me. Okay, why do I bring that up? Because in Romans 8, 28, it says, to them that love God. If you love the Lord, you will be an obedient and faithful Christian. If you are a disobedient and unfaithful Christian, if you are a backslidden and carnal Christian, then you don't love the Lord. And so this verse doesn't really apply to you. Okay, now even for any child of God, even the backslidden, if God chastens you, if God brings trouble into your life for the purpose of punishing you for your sin and trying to make you turn around to Him, then even that is for your good. Okay, chastening our children is for their benefit. It's not to hurt them. It's to be a blessing to them. And God chastens His children. But much better to be an obedient child who is not in need of chastening but can receive the blessing of the Father. Okay, you'd much rather be in fellowship with your Heavenly Father than out of fellowship and experience His chastening. Okay, so we know that all things work together for good. And that is something that um, sometimes people just quote that, you know, they, they see a Christian in trouble and they will remember all things work together for good. And it can just be kind of a pious, um, I don't know, just sometimes it comes from people who don't really have the right to say it. But um, it is true. Everything works together for your good. Okay, so remember that. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I'm sure this is not new for you. Um, but it's true. So those who, are, those who love God are the called according to His purpose. You've been called by God into His work. You are being an obedient child and you're actively involved in serving Christ. Then you can take this promise and you can claim it. Okay, it's a very, very important thing. Um, I think of a verse in Job where it says, Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Okay, you sit around a fire and you hear the, the sparks popping, the logs popping, and the sparks are flying upward. Well, that's, that reminds us, as Job said, that man is born to trouble. We all have problems, we all have troubles, but if we love the Lord and are called according to His purpose, then we can know that all of those troubles that we face work for our benefit. Okay, and that's a great thing to be able to say. All right, um, <clears throat> we need to keep things in our life 
in perspective. And he continues, okay, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For, so this is not you know, a break, this is not a new subject here. For whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Our relationship with God and our eternal destiny are secure and unchangeable. You can rest in that and not worry about day-by-day -day troubles. Okay, and this is a very, very interesting passage of Scripture here and a very important passage of Scripture. You get in trouble. You have problems. Okay, all things work together for good, but you have, you have these difficulties, and they hurt and they bother you, and you sometimes worry about them and so on. But remember, you're a child of God. You have been predestinated by the Father to certain things. And not only has He predestinated you to certain things in your future, but He has also, He says here, He's called you, He has justified you, and He has glorified you. Okay? So, the day-by-day -day troubles in life are nothing compared to the things that God has promised us and which are secure because they are the promises of God who cannot lie. Okay? And so we have to keep things in perspective. Um, he has predestinated us. Well, predestination is an action that is based on God's foreknowledge, which is an attribute. Okay, God knows the end from the beginning. Okay, so that is, is something that, that is true of God always. He always knows everything. And to be omniscient, to be all-knowing, is the past, the present, and the future. Okay, God is an eternal being. He is all-knowing at all times. He knows everything always, the end from the beginning. So, He has predestinated us according to His foreknowledge, for whom He did foreknow. Okay? An attribute of God. Those that He foreknew, He did predestinate. Now, what is it that He has predestinated? Okay, predestination we see here is according to foreknowledge. And let me just say this, and you can look this up later. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says that election, which is God's choosing, of His people. Election is also based on foreknowledge. So predestination and election are both according to God's foreknowledge, according to what He knows in advance. Okay, and that's very, very important to remember. There are reasons why God has predestinated certain people and chosen certain people. Okay, it's according to what God knows about them in the future. Predestination and election are not arbitrary acts of God whereby, whereby He chose to save a few and condemn the rest. When He could have saved all, had He only wanted to. I want you to think about that. Now we're going to talk a little bit uh, today about uh, Calvinism. We're not going to get into any great detail. But the Calvinist says that God 
had he chosen to, could have saved every person in the world because it's simply a matter of God's sovereign choice. So if God had wanted to, he could have decided to save everyone. And yet, for some reason, which apparently is only known to God, he chose to save just a few. And beloved, it's very, very, very few. America has been called by some a Christian nation, and that is far from the truth. Okay, most people who go to so-called Christian churches are not born-again people. And the percentage of people that even go to Christian churches is dropping all the time. Okay, the percentage of, of born-again people in America is probably, I don't know, in the neighborhood of maybe 5 or 10 percent. Okay, it could be a little higher. I don't, I don't know for sure, but it's somewhere around there. Um, and so we're not a Christian nation. And then look at the rest of the world. What percentage of the people of India are born again? What percentage of China are born again? What percentage of, let's say, Indonesia, which is mostly Muslim, are born again? And then you've got the entire Middle East, which is almost 100% Muslim. You've got Europe, which is apostate Christian, very few saved people. The percentage of Christians in this world is very, very, very small. Why did God only choose, say, 5% of the world's population? Is he a God of love? It doesn't sound like it if Calvinism were true, okay? hard to say you love people and let and yet you choose to cause them to go to hell okay because they don't have a free will god makes the decisions that's crazy um there is no verse in the bible that says that god predestinated or chose anyone to believe okay there's no verse in the Bible that says that God predestinated or chose anyone to believe. In fact, not one of the five main points of Calvinism is backed up by a clear, plain statement of Scripture. Calvinism is based on logic, not Scripture. And the logic starts off with an unbiblical premise. And if, you, if your premise is false then all the logic that you add to that premise is also false. Okay, and here is their premise. The premise is an extreme version of the sovereignty of God. Now, do we believe that God is the sovereign of the universe? Absolutely. Is he the ruler of the universe? Yes, he is. Um, but Calvinism in its zeal for the sovereignty of God, has decided that God makes every single decision. Okay, I went to my closet to choose a shirt. And the first shirt that I picked up was a blue and black plaid. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, maybe I'll wear this today. But then I looked and I saw this shirt on a hanger in the closet. And I thought, well, I haven't worn that shirt in a while. I think I'll wear it today. And I pulled it out and looked at it and it looked okay. It didn't need to be ironed or anything like that. So I thought, I'll wear this one today. The Calvinist says, and honestly, this is the truth. This is what they say. I didn't choose this shirt. God in eternity past chose this shirt for me. And I'm wearing this shirt today because God made that decision, not because I did. I only think that I have a will and can choose my own shirt. Okay? There is not a verse in the Bible that says that God makes every decision. And I want you to think, 
and there are plenty of writings of Calvinists who will say this is what they believe. If God makes every decision, then God caused Satan to rebel against him when he said, I will exalt my throne above the Most High. That was God making him say that. So God caused Satan to sin and to fall and the, the, some of the angels to follow him. That was all God's doing. And then Satan, in the form of a serpent, went to the Garden of Eden and tempted Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve followed the direction of the serpent and sinned against God. And the Calvinist, and this is true, okay, I'm not exaggerating what they say. The Calvinist says God caused that to happen. That, <laughs> this is weird. God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it was His will because God's will is sovereign. It cannot be thwarted. It cannot be rejected. It cannot be disobeyed. It was God's will for them to sin so that He could send the Redeemer. So they had to sin. They had to do God's will. So God says, don't eat of that tree. But it was His will for them to eat of the tree. So it was God's will for them to break His commandment. And they would go on to say that every time you and I sin, we are fulfilling the will of God. Because God is sovereign. And no one can stand against the will of God. Now, beloved, there is certainly not a single verse in the Bible that says anything near that. In fact, let me turn over to James chapter 1 quickly. James chapter 1 and verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay, listen to that. When you're tempted, you cannot blame it on God. You cannot say, God made me do that. Because God cannot be tempted with evil. God does not do wrong. He never, ever, ever has done wrong. He never wants to do wrong. Neither tempteth he any man. God never caused a man to sin. He doesn't cause you and me to sin. He didn't cause, and we'll look in the coming weeks into the life of Pharaoh and Jacob and different ones, Esau and so on. God did not cause them to sin. God did not cause Adam and Eve to sin. God instead gave them a free will. And He has given us a free will. He talks to us, He speaks to us through His Word, through the leadership of the Spirit of God now that we're saved. And He tells us to do His will. We have a, a will that we can choose. And unfortunately, sometimes we choose wrong. Praise God, He has paid for those sins and there is a pathway of, of forgiveness and cleansing so that we can walk in fellowship with Him. Okay, um, so He has predestinated us. God has predetermined. There is something that is going to happen to us. In fact, there are a number of things that are going to happen to us that He has predetermined. He has decided this is going to happen, period. Okay, nothing is going to prevent it. Nothing can stand in the way. This is going to happen. He has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Okay, predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. Um, he has predestinated every believer to be conformed to the image of Christ. We are going to be like Christ someday. Now, before I go any further on that, let me back up a little bit. I don't want to forget this. For whom He did foreknow. God foreknows everything. If God tarries and the world continues as it is for another thousand years, 
There's sev seven billion people on the planet right now, and God knows every single one of them. He knows every name. He knows how they were born. He knows everything about them. He knew that back before he created the world. And if the world goes on for another thousand years, and let's say the population of the world reaches 15 or 20 billion, which I don't think it could ever happen. I think some catastrophe would have to happen to reduce the population. But anyway, let's say someday there were 20 billion people on the earth. And in, in that thousand year period, there were 30 or 40 billion people who lived on top of the, I don't know, 10 or so billion people who've already lived. God would know everything about every single one of them. He foreknows them. So what does he mean when he says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son? Does this mean he, that everyone is going to be conformed to the image of Christ, which would mean universal salvation? No one goes to hell? But the scripture says, Jesus said, that the way to heaven is narrow and few go in. But the way to hell, the way to destruction is broad and many go in there. God has told us that those who make it to heaven are going to be a small portion of those who are condemned to hell. Okay, so obviously there is no such thing as universal salvation. So what does he mean when he says, for whom he did foreknow? Well, I would ask you the question, what is it that makes the difference between a person who is condemned to hell and a person who is redeemed and spends eternity in heaven? Well, let's turn back to John chapter 3. Okay, John chapter 3, we're going to look at some very simple verses that every one of you is familiar with. John chapter 3, this is the passage where the Lord is talking to Nicodemus. And you all know these verses. Um, oh, let's start in verse 14. And I'll try not to comment too much on them for time's sake, but... As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Obviously, God wants everyone to be saved, and He's made the provision for the salvation of the whole world. Christ died for the sins of the world, not the sins of a few, and everyone can be saved. Okay, and that is God's desire, that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Those who believe in Christ are not condemned. Those are the ones who go to heaven. They're not condemned by God. And what do they have to do to be in that state? They have to believe. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe he was God in the flesh who died on the cross and paid for your sins, he was buried and raised from the dead, and you are trusting Him and Him alone for your salvation, then you are not condemned. Okay? He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Um, you and I, were born of sinful parents. We were born in sin. We were in Adam and we were condemned because we were sinners. We grew to a certain age. For me it was 16. I trusted Christ as my Savior when I was 16 years old. A man sat down and explained the gospel to me, showed it to me in the Bible that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ 
explain the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for my sins, and I trusted Him as my Savior. I was 16. Some of you men could have been children. You may have been an adult. But at some point, you put your faith in Christ. You believed. Before that moment, you were an unbeliever. Before that moment, you were condemned because you did not believe. After that moment, you were not condemned. Why? Because you believed. The difference between the great majority who go to hell and the few that go to heaven, the difference is faith in Jesus Christ. At some point in time, individually, one by one, person by person, they trusted Christ as their Savior. They were born again into God's family, and they moved from death to life, and they will live with God forever. So what is it that makes the difference between the vast majority on their way to hell and the small percentage, the small group that is on their way to heaven? Faith is what makes the difference. And so when he says, for whom he did foreknow, them he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. What did God foreknow? He foreknows every person who's alive. He foreknows every person who ever will live. But what is it about them Did he predestinate some to be like Christ because of the nation they were born into, of the color of their skin, of what? What is it? Their education level, their their financial situation? Of course not. He foreknows who will believe. That's what makes the difference. None of those other things make a bit of difference as to who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Okay? What makes the difference is who believes. And so God foreknew those who would trust Christ as Savior. He foreknew the believers. And so believers are predestinated. What are they predestinated to? To someday be just like Jesus Christ, to be conformed to the image of His Son. Okay, someday you and I will be in heaven before the Lord. I think of uh, 1 John chapter 3, I think it's it's verse 2, maybe verse 3, right around in there, where it says that we shall be made like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Someday the Lord is going to take us to be with Him and we are going to stand face to face with our Savior. We will see Him. And when we see Him, we will be made like Him because we see Him as He is. That experience, that the Lord's power when we see Christ face to face, that is when we will be totally, completely changed transformed into the image of His Son. Okay, and that event, that experience that you and I are going to go through has been predestinated by Almighty God. The sovereign creator of the universe has predetermined that you and I are going to be there. We we are going to go through that experience. Okay, that is a marvelous, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. You talk about assurance of salvation. You talk about eternal security. The Father has predestinated that you are going to stand before the throne of God and see Jesus Christ face to face and be made like Him. Okay, that is a marvelous thing to think about. That's a glorious thing to think about. Never, ever, ever, ever doubt your salvation because these things are complete and secure. Okay, so whom He foreknew, and if you're a believer in Christ, He foreknew you. Okay, 
He foreknew Mike Floyd. He didn't make me believe, but he knew I would believe. And so he predestinated me to someday be like Jesus. Oh, what a marvelous thing. What a wonderful thing. You can put your name there. For whom he did foreknow, that whom could be you, whatever your name might be. Okay? So whom he did foreknow, them he also called. He called us. Um, hold on just a minute. I don't think I put this in my notes, but... Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Okay, how do you get called to salvation? Well, it was the work of God in eternity past. and Well, God knew it all in eternity past. And he foreknew you and he predestinated you and he called you. But the actual calling was when someone gave you the gospel. Okay, a man named Jim Williamson talked to me about Jesus Christ and convinced me to put my trust in, in Christ. Okay, that's when I called because that is the first time I ever understood the gospel of Christ. Oh, I knew that, that Christ lived and He died and He was raised and He supposedly died for the sins of the world. I didn't know that meant he died for my sins and that I would be saved by God's grace through faith. Okay, but I understood it that day in 1965 and I trusted Christ as my Savior. Okay, that's when I was called. We are called by the gospel. And every time you go out and witness to somebody, even every time that you preach on the street in a village or something along those lines, every time you speak, preach in church before a gathering of the saints with lost people in that crowd, you are calling people by the gospel, calling them to put their faith in Christ. Okay, so those that he pre did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified, which means to be declared righteous. For the judge to say, you are not guilty of your sins. Your sins are washed away. Okay, you are, you, the judge says not guilty, you're acquitted. And so you're able to have eternal life. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Um, oh, let's see. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2 if you would. Ephesians chapter 2. Um... We'll start in verse 4. Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You and I, because we've trusted in Christ, we are in Christ. We're now part of Him. We're part of His body. And so we have been quickened or made alive. We've been given new life. We have been raised up with Christ. It's as though we have been resurrected from the dead already and ascended with Him and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay? Beloved, God looks at you and me and He sees us as though we are already in heaven, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, in Christ, glorified with Him and in Him. Okay? So these things, most of what He says here is in the past. The glorification we have not yet experienced. We're still in this old body that groans and travails together in pain until now. We saw that last week. Okay, and yes, we groan in pain. But in the mind of God, these decisions that He made in eternity past are as though they are already accomplished. And we have already been glorified in the Lord. Okay, all things work together for good. 
not only in this life, but even beyond this life. We suffer here. But what is our future? Our future is eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our future is eternity with God, with no pain, with no suffering, no sorrow, no tears. Okay, all of those things will be gone, and it's going to be absolutely glory forever and ever and ever. Okay, so whom he foreknew, he predestinated to be someday exactly like the Son, exactly like the Lord Jesus. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Isn't this wonderful? It's absolutely fantastic. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop there as far as going on in the text. Um, how many minutes have we covered? Okay, we've been 41 minutes. I'm going to add just a little bit here. And this is going to be just very brief. It's just going to be skimming the surface. But I wanted to talk because of this subject and because of the future in Romans. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about Israel and so on. And he's going to touch on subjects that are often used by Calvinists to try to, to teach their doctrines. Um, the Calvinists say they have got five main points. I really think they've got six because the five are all based on their false understanding of sovereignty. Sovereignty does not mean that no one ever goes against the will of God. If you sin, you are going against the will of God. Okay? If you sin, whether it's omission or commission, you sin, you're going against the will of God. You're thwarting the will of God. You will be held accountable for that. You will be responsible for that. And every person on earth that fights the Lord, that goes against God, will be held accountable for that. And the majority, because of their sin, will be in hell forever. For their sin and their unbelief in Christ. Okay. But there are five points of Calvinism. And you've probably heard it. It's under the title TULIP. Okay, it's an acrostic. Each letter stands for something. First of all, the T stands for total depravity, which the Calvinist says that man is sinful and unable to save his own soul. And that's true. We believe that. But the Calvinist adds that man is incapable of unbelief, that Man has to be given the gift of faith and even regenerated, which means he has to be born again before he is capable of believing. That's peculiar. So you, you have to be saved before you can believe, and yet doesn't the Scripture continually say, for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is required for salvation. You don't get saved and then believe. You have to believe in order to be saved. There is no scripture anywhere that says that a lost person is unable to believe. 2 Corinthians 5.10, or pardon me, 5.11, Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. If we could be persuaded, we must be able to believe. Okay? They say, well, man, the unsaved man is not capable of communicating with God. Didn't Adam and Eve communicate with God when they were lost after they sinned? Yes, they did. God spoke to them in the garden, and they heard Him, and they replied to Him. Okay? So the lost person can communicate with God, and God can communicate with him. Adam and Eve understood God when he spoke, and a lost person can read the gospel in the Bible and understand it and can believe it. Okay, uh, the U stands for unconditional election. Uh, God chose with no reason. Okay, just arbitrary, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I choose you, I choose you, I choose you, I choose you. Just arbitrary choosing. 
And yet the scripture over and over and over and over and over again says that faith is a requirement for salvation. There is a condition to salvation you must believe. Okay? You must believe. For whom he did foreknow, what did he foreknow? It was obvious he foreknew who would believe. And he chose to save believers. Limited atonement is the L. And that is so contrary to Scripture, this one should blow every Calvinist away. Okay? This unconditional election is, is simply a lie. They say Jesus only died for the elect. The few that God knew would believe, the few that God chose to believe, Jesus died for them and not for anyone else. They say it's not possible that the sovereign God could die for someone who would not accept the payment. And that's nonsense. Okay? Um, John 1.29. John, seeing Jesus, said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay? And 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only. Not just us who believe it. Jesus is the propitiation, the satisfactory payment for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for everybody. Limited atonement is a fraud. It's a lie. Irresistible grace is what the I stands for. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Jesus, seeing Jerusalem, he cried out, Oh, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen does her chicks. And then he says something important. He says, And ye would not. The Jewish people of Jerusalem that Christ was looking at and speaking to, they resisted the grace of God. God wanted to save them. Christ wanted to save them. But they would not. They turned away. They refused the grace of God, and they were lost. Um, P is perseverance of the saints, which basically means that if you live a good enough life, then you won't lose your salvation. And they say that if you're truly born again, you will live that good enough life. But beloved, in the Calvinist gospel, works are necessary for salvation. If you don't work, then you don't have it. Okay? That is not eternal security. Eternal security says that God keeps you. God keeps you. Remember John 28 where it says that we are in Christ's hand and Christ is in God's hand? Okay? It's not you and me holding you know, on to God and, and hoping we hang on and hang on and hang on. No. It's God reaching down and taking us and holding on to us. We are kept by the power of God. You'll also find that in 1 Peter 1 verses 4 and 5. Okay, so that is TULIP, and just a very fast um, explanation of it and showing where it's wrong, and we may get into that more in the future uh, as we get into Romans 9, 10, and 11. All right, thank you very much.